thing. So pleased to be joined now by former President w George W. Bush. I saw you reading there, Mr. President. Welcome. Good to have you back. You, it's good to see you, sir. I'm glad you're doing well. I'm doing very well. I love your new book. Uh, I really do, out of many, one. Uh, but for your generosity and time, I want to give you a tip. Uh, one of your editors, uh, Derek Reed, his dad, Mike Reed, is one of the big bosses at Salem. Never play golf with that man. Do not give him strokes. If you're ever on a tee with Derek Reed or his dad, do not give them strokes. They're bandits. Good advice. Thank you. I want to ask you a couple of technical questions, and I want to talk about the portraits, and I want to talk about immigration. I cannot figure out the order of portraits in this book, Mr. President. I went through it again and again and again. I've studied it. How did they line up this way? Do you pull them out of a hat? No, no, Hugh. Uh, so my first uh, painting was Joseph Kim, uh, a North Korean escapee. I know him well. Uh, and I wasn't sure I was going to do a book at that point. But uh, so I painted Joseph. I liked the painting. And then I went to Paula Rendon, who was like a second mother to my brothers and my sister and me. Uh, and then they just fell in place after that. Uh, the, the, the key decision was famous or not famous. And uh, I, I, you know, I, I took some famous people in the hopes of selling this book. Oh, you're going to sell a lot of these books and not because of the famous people. I think the stories are amazing, Mr. President. And I'm going to start with uh, three pictures I'm going to put on the screen because these are the only three portraits that have multicolored backgrounds. It's Arnold, and I know the story about yeah. why Arnold, but also Alfia Elicheva and Carlos Rivella. So my technical question, if people are looking this on the YouTube channel, why do you use two color backgrounds for those two people? Arnold, it's because that's what he sent you, but what about the other two? Well, on Alfie, I ran out of uh, orange paint, <laughs> I guess. I, I can't remember why. Uh, I actually uh, was uh, doing the background and liked, uh, I liked the green and red, they're complementary colors, and so I left it on. I think that the green, triangle there at the on the bottom right is also interesting and so rather than paint it out uh i left it with carlos the uh background was orange background was orange to begin with and just a light light green wash and i thought that looked interesting it's very they're both they're beautiful and i but they're different all the other ones have unicolor backgrounds now i want to talk about alfia's eyes if we can put that back up team this is one of the amazing stories. She is a Muslim Tartar from outside of Moscow in the days after the wall come down. Her dad is a player. He's assassinated when she's 11. She somehow gets to the United States. The president tells the story. What an amazing story. But look at her eyes, Mr. President. How hard are eyes to do? She and Dina Powell McCormick, they've got the most amazing eyes. Well, thank you very much. Eyes are very important to try to capture somebody's soul. Uh, Hugh, one of the things that I think is uh, important to tell about her story is that a Jewish guy in Moscow who was a friend of her dad's helped the family uh, immigrate to the United States. So the Jewish guy saved the Muslim family, which I think is a beautiful story. Uh, uh, Althea is a, uh, uh, she, she works at Bridgestone and has got four children and a very impressive person who's overcome a lot. And the eyes really, uh, were meant to convey a sense of uh, joy, but a sense of determination. She's a determined she's, woman. She's also a very grateful woman. There's a theme throughout almost all of these portraits. These people are incredibly grateful to that Jewish gentleman who helped her get here and to everyone who helped her once she got to America. Carlos Ravella, he's a refugee from yeah. the El Salvador Civil War. He's a very grateful man, too. And I've never listened to a testimony that's greater for two-year college than uh, Mr. Rovella gives you in your book. Yeah, he's really, uh, he's, a, he's a neat guy. Uh, you know, he, uh, he, his family witnessed the, uh, the, in the 1980s, the upheaval in El Salvador. He decides to come here. What's interesting about Carlos, he's raised Catholic, but a Presbyterian church and family helped him settle in Wichita. And, uh, you know, he's a, he's a teacher, as is his wife, and he loves being an American. He's an enthusiast about uh, our, our country. You know, I, I was looking for climate disruption, and when I saw Carlos went from El Salvador to Wichita State Huskerland, 
I also compared it to <laughs> Kim Mitchell going from Da Nang to Lake Superior. There's some shocks here in the climate world, aren't there? <laughs> let, me, let me let me tell you about Kim Mitchell quickly. Uh, or, the, or the listeners, you already know. But Kim was discovered on the side of the road clutching her dead mother in Vietnam. A South Vietnamese soldier took her to an orphanage run by nuns. Uh, a U.S. airman uh, sees the little baby there and adopts her and takes her to Wisconsin, as you mentioned. And she ends up at the Naval Academy, a, a high-ranking officer. She works with veterans groups. But the amazing thing about her story was one day she, she gets an email uh, from a, a South Vietnamese name she wasn't sure of, and it turns out to be the sergeant who had rescued her on the side of the road years ago. And, and they re, it had a reunion. And it's to me, it's a beautiful story of someone who saved a life, someone who's lived a life, and they were able to reunion. I also find her story to be amazing, uh, George W. Bush, because Kim Mitchell's father, who rescued her from Danang Sacred Heart Orphanage, is struck and killed by lightning a week before she goes to the Naval Academy. Yeah. The Naval Academy gives her a year off to help her family. She goes and she excels, and she got no bitterness with life. And I don't want to hear anyone complain about their life when you read some of these stories. None of us have a hard life compared to these refugees. Uh, David, well, you know, uh, Hugh, it's really interesting. Interesting point you make, real quick. Uh, one of the reasons I wrote the book was to remind our citizens uh, how fortunate we are to have people like Kim Mitchell in our midst, people who uh, really appreciate freedom, people who are patriotic, people who are uh, whose entrepreneurial spirits get ignited uh, when they come to a place where if you dream big and work hard, you have a chance to make it. And Americans don't many Americans don't really realize uh, the deprivation that can take place in other societies and how the human soul can be so repressed. And yet when it comes here to the States, it flourishes. Yeah, suffering does not break people. They all excel in this book. Now you had your choice of stories, but it's very inspiring. One of the most inspiring books I've read in a long time because of these stories. David Faraday, I want to put his picture up here. I, I, I glommed onto David Faraday because he's from Bangor, Ulster, which is 15 miles from St. Field Ulster, which is where my great-grandfather grew up. And like uh, my great-grandfather, oh, he, uh, he, he got over here, but he is a recovering addict and alcoholic. He's also a USO guy. I love these people like Gary Sinise and John Androzic. Faraday goes out and sees our troops. Was his inclusion your salute to those men and women who serve our troops by visiting them? Absolutely. I know Faraday. Uh, he's, a, he's a very funny man. Uh, yeah. I also know of uh, his overcoming addictions. Uh, and uh, I'm very aware of how much time he spends with our military. And for that, I'm very grateful. I mean, you know, there's story after story in the book that shows how people who are so grateful about being able to become citizens of this country in turn give back to help other people. And there's an example of David Faraday. I mean, he can be he making good money, he can sit around and do nothing, uh, but instead uh, really cares about our troops. And and I don't mean just shows up for an event. Uh, he's 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 dedicated and spends time. There are there are categories of people who show up once and then there are the people like Faraday and Sinise and Androzic. They show up again and again. Now, I want to go back to Joseph Kim, if we can put up his portrait, uh, because this is hardly believable that he's alive. Uh, famine took his father in North Korea. He's living near <laughs> Siberia. Uh, he has to run across. He lives homeless in North Korea, which I didn't think you could even do. He has to run across a frozen river. A bunch of Yaleys had started something called Liberty in North Korea helped him. Then Catholic Charities helped him. And then this very handsome man somehow gets here. And, you know, when we were in L.A., when we were talking about your first book, you talked to me about the layers and textures that go into a painting. I can't stop looking. He's a very handsome man, but this is a very good painting, Mr. President. How long does this take? You know, Hugh, I'm, it's a small canvas, so it didn't take nearly as long as some of the big canvases, obviously. I love this painting. Uh, first of all, I like the colors I used, but uh, the more I thought about it when I was painting it, it's a, it's a, a symbol of a guy who's come from darkness to light. Uh, I mean, it, it's hard to believe this guy's life was so severe. I mean, he was a beggar. He was a thief. 
just to survive at age 14. And he goes, he, by the way, one of the things he didn't mention is his mother had gone to China with his sister to sell her. So they had movies, uh, money to, to live on. And she came back and she died in a prison camp. And so uh, his spirit is strong. I mean, he, he's a funny guy. He's very smart, very capable. He's still adjusting. Uh, but he's getting help from other citizens. Uh, some of the Korean, Korean American community is helping him and, uh, and he works for us. And so I see him quite frequently. It's an amazing story, an amazing picture as is that of Gene Celestine Lakin. Now I think it's pretty hard to rank suffering, uh, but this one is gonna go at the top of my list. It's a beautiful portrait, by the way, she's a beautiful woman. Um, she is a Tutsi in Rwanda when the extremist Houthis go on their rampage. Her father splits up the family. She grabs the twin ba twin little sisters. She's 10 years old. She later comes back, finds her mom and her brother dead on the road. Then she sees her father running, hacked down and murdered. Then she's consigned to a killing pen when a Congo man takes her and takes her to the Congo and sexually abuses her. She runs away. She gets a foster family. The foster family comes to America, but she's sexually abused again. She finally gets out of Missouri, gets to Washington State. And here's the amazing thing. She is grateful. She's full of forgiveness. Now, I had Admiral McRaven on earlier this week, Mr. President. He says forgiveness is the hardest thing to do, hardest thing to ask for. This yeah. woman should not be forgiving anyone. She forgives everybody. She's amazing. Well, I, I know her, and I'm, it's not fake forgiveness. <laughs> it's genuine forgiveness. And as a result of unburdening her soul of hatred and anger, she is a joy, joyful person. And it's, yeah, I agree with you. It's just hard to believe, but it's true. And, uh, you know, my hope is post COVID that she's able to go on the road and share her story with uh, different groups because she, she, she'll light up a room. And uh, uh, she spoke recently at the Bush Center and it was powerful. I mean, really powerful. And she's a, you're right. She's an absolutely beautiful woman. Uh, and uh, she's in higher education. She wants to give back. Ma married a good guy and got a child. And she lives in Houston right now. It's just amazing from where she came from, as is Gilbert. Now, I, I'm not so good with pronunciation of names, Mr. President, so help me out here. Gilbert Tuhabonye, yeah. do I got it right? That's good enough, yeah. Okay, he is also I'm, a I'm not so good. I'm not so good with names either. <laughs> He's in Burundi, not Rwanda, when the Houthis go on the rampage, the extremist Houthi. He's trapped in a school. They set fire to it. He gets burned up, but he's a runner, and he kept on running. And I think that's an amazing story, but I want to yeah. ask you about skin pigment. How hard is it to do the variations of skin pigment among our African-American citizens that you have to paint in this book? You know, not that hard once you get used to it. Uh, First of all, just real quick, one of the things that makes Gilbert's story so unique is that it was his classmates who helped, the, the Hutu classmates helped lock him in and burn him. Anyway, he lives in Austin. The reason I got to know him is my daughter, Jenna, was going to the University of Texas, and Gilbert got her in a running club. And anybody can get my daughter out of bed early Saturday morning when she's a co-ed is a, is a powerful person. Uh, but, you know... Uh, it's really not that hard. I'd, I'd had some other experiences painting, uh, for example, African leaders, uh, Kofor of Ghana, uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf of uh, Liberia. And, and it's a matter of just blending, uh, you know, your, your browns and your reds. Uh, and anyway, it, I, I, I'm not that concerned about it anymore. Uh, you. you know, initially I was at first, but it just takes practice. I want to go to a dreamer. Carlos Mendez. By the way, this is a very handsome portrait of Carlos Mendez, yeah. if we can put this up. I mean, it's very, the background, the eyes, the glass. Are, are glasses difficult to paint, Mr. President, on top of a, a face like that? That's just a technical question. Are they? No, right? easy. All right. Now, easy. He is an, he's an amazing guy. He swims the Rio with his mother, comes into a gas station full of stuff. He's amazed. But then he reunites with his father and mom in Dallas. And then his dad is uh, severely injured and his mother is killed in a car crash. And then you have a long list of right. people who help him. I love this. You got K Karen Harmon, Mayor Cisneros, Livingstone Church, Dreamers. I mean, this isn't really a debate about sending people back like him. We're not going to send them back, and nor should we send them back. 
This is their country. And I think that story makes that so obvious to people. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, the other day I was on uh, uh, the Today Show uh, and I unfortunately cast a pretty wide brush about the Republican Party. Uh, I, what I should have said, if I were more uh, circumspect, was that there are some voices in our party who are the sound nativist. Certainly not all, uh, and certainly not you. And uh, the DACA issue is one that I think there's going to be a lot of Republicans when, when the issue is explained properly, will say, yeah, let's fix this. I mean, to me, it's the easiest fix of all, of all the complicated problems facing immigration. And uh, Carlos is the perfect example of that. He's a, and he's an engineer and he's a contributing citizen. Uh, he, he, as Cisneros reported, he's one of the smartest kids he knows. And one of the things that immigration does for our country, it enhances our brain power. Yeah, I, uh, we'll come back to talk about immigration. I'm kind of what the British Tories would call a wet. I would let everybody stay in the country who hasn't committed a crime. Everybody, all 20 million. I just want to build the wall. We'll come back to the policy at the end. But the, the dreamers are not hard. Uh, Carlos Mendez is not hard. I want to talk to you about Tier Suzuki next. Because everybody should yeah. have seen the movie The Killing Fields. Everybody should know about Pol Pot. She lived it. Now, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops gets her here. There are a lot of Catholics in your book, by the way. And she is quite amazing, and her father is amazing. I don't know if he was with Wycliffe or whatever. His life is devoted to getting scripture into the Cambodian language. I think the saddest place and I, places I have been in the world is Cambodia, Mr. President. She does not seem sad at all to me. She survived the killing fields. It's amazing. Uh, it is, yeah. And I think uh, it's because of her parents. Uh, and I believe it's because of religion. Uh, I, I believe, I, I think her parents are, you know, joyful people. Tear, I showed her her portrait and she said, finally, somebody sees me. Oh. Which I thought was, uh, uh, you know, a beautiful, a beautiful summary of, of the portraits of, uh, put up on the walls here at the Bush Center. That's quite a compliment. Uh, Bob Fu is next. And I wanted to talk about him for a couple of reasons. Uh, he is uh, an escapee, a religious man from China, which has been much in the news. He stresses that strangers flee fleeing religious persecution are exactly whom the framers of this country would welcome. And he has now started China Aid to help the persecuted church in China. How did you find Mr. Fu, Mr. President? And uh, what do you think about our going to the Olympics next year? in Beijing, given their, well, the... Uh, well, well, you know, I, uh, I, first of all, I had this, had that decision to make in 2008 and went, and I'm glad I did. Uh, we'll let the, the elected officials now to make that determination. Uh, I, uh, uh, I met food because uh, oftentimes before I'd go to China, I would meet with religious dissidents uh, from the Chinese religious dissidents to send a signal uh, to the Chinese leaders that I was going to honor my word, what I told both of them, and that is I'm going to, I'm going to push for religious freedom. I won't embarrass you, but just know that uh, I, I, during our conversations, uh, we'll cover a lot of other topics, but I, I, I believe in the, the power of religion to bring peace to societies. And so I met Bob Fu at the White House. Well, I'll tell you, Mr. President, I remember you're going to the Olympics in 08. Uh, you had a stare down with a guy named Putin who's staring down the world right now. And I don't know if you're going to comment on that. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's been a long time. He continues to stare down the world, but you stared him down in Beijing. I wish somebody would do that. Do we need to do that right now? Yeah, I, I think Putin responds to toughness. The question is, you got to have credibility, uh, you know, and uh, that's one of the roles of the president is to develop credibility over time. And, uh, but yeah, no, it was a stare down because he had just invaded Georgia. Yeah. And uh, my, one of my final words to Putin was this. I said, I, I called him down. So uh, Putin and his interpreter sat next to me and Laura at the Olympics, all these cameras on us and everything. And I was hot because of the invasion. Medvedev was the acting president, but Putin was the real power. And I said, I've been telling you for years that Shakasvili is hot blooded. And Putin said, uh, I'm hot blooded. And I said, no, Vladimir, you're cold blooded. And that's the last thing I said to him.
Well, he still is. I hope uh, President Biden adopts the same stare down. Let's go back to Amy Elsa, because I love the fact she's in your building. You see her yeah. every day. She's an Ethiopian. I looked up, by the way, the Church of St. George in Lalabella, and it is as extraordinary as you describe. but she is a woman of faith. The uh, Ethiopian Coptic Church is apparently alive and well in Dallas. It is. Uh, this is a woman who sits and collects parking tickets all day long and always had a smile on her face. And if she was looking down at something as you pulled your car in, uh, she was generally reading scripture. Very religious person. She was very hesitant, by the way, for me to paint her. I hope I captured her beauty because she's an extraordinarily beautiful woman. But uh, one of her proudest accomplishments besides uh, raising her children in a peaceful society is uh, uh, being involved with the Ethiopian church. Religion plays a huge part in the lives of many of the people here in the book. And it also plays a huge life in the uh, spirit of the organizations that have helped them. And uh, uh, that's why freedom of religion is such an important component of our national character. Our next portrait, Shana O. Oh. Another Korean, North Korean, crosses the Yalu River to escape. Another great testament to faith. And she has founded Emancipate North Korea. She has a far more serious look than did Amy Elsa. She, she looks very determined, as you have to be, I guess, to get across the Yalu River into China, Mr. President. Yeah, this, this, this woman crossed as a uh, child alone and knew nothing about religion. The only religion in North Korea is the religion of, of the, the, the uh, vaunted leader. And uh, uh, she uh, is taken in by a underground missionary. And the woman says, I love you unconditionally and you don't have to worry. And uh, Shinhai has no idea what that means. But uh, over time, she learned what love meant. And when she finally made it to the States, we helped her out of the Bush Center, helped her with a scholarship to a Chicago Theological Seminary. Uh, and it, it shows the amazing power of grace. Uh, and uh, also, I tried to reflect not only that, but also her courage. Imagine what it's like to be a, a single woman uh, traveling through China alone. Many of those girls ends up with six sex slaves or forced marriages. And yet she's now in the United States and married. And a wonderful, uplifting story. Your first book of portraits were Wounded Warriors. There's only one wounded warrior in this book, Florent Groberg. I want to talk about Captain Groberg for a couple of seconds. He is a recipient of the Medal of Honor. President Obama bestowed it upon him. Uh, he wanted his fellow warriors named at his ceremony because they could not be. They did not survive. Uh, he rushed at a suicide bomber who was aiming at his higher-ups. Um, it's an amazing portrait. It's different than most of them. The Medal of Honor is colored in, in bright colors. He still hasn't met Michael Jordan. You put in the book, let's get that fixed, MJ. So I hope that happens. We'll talk about it here. But but only one wounded warrior in this book. Is that, uh, you know, you're just going to do one because you did so many before in this book? Yeah, that's right. And uh, what, what Americans have got to know is that there's a lot of uh, non-citizens in uniform. A lot of Medal of Honors have gone to non-citizens. And, uh, and so, I, I, yes, I wanted Flo to... Uh, uh, represent the immigrants who uh, are who aren't even citizens uh, uh, in our in our military. So you know, one of the amazing events you as I was president, I watched the swearing in of uh, you know Sergeant Dan Ohan, who's a Marine at Bethesda. So this guy's a Mexican citizen at the time, wearing the Marine uniform, wounded in combat, gets healed in the hospital, and is sworn in as a citizen. And yeah, it's just so powerful to believe that people are willing to sacrifice for a country that's not even their own. In other words, they feel such kinship with America, they're willing to serve. And my view is anybody who wears our uniform in combat ought to be automatically a citizen. And uh, agree. And, and I hope just, Mike just, like, is just like the interpreter in the book. That, I, I was just coming up to the interpreters. I'm going to bring them up in the, in the context of Afghanistan in a second. If I can, I want to put up a uh, quartet, Mr. President, of Madeleine Albright, Henry Kissinger, Dina Powell McCormick, and Yuval Levin. Uh, the bottom two served you. The top two advised you. I was with Dr. Kissinger not long ago. I love this portrait of, of Lion in Winter, Dr. Kissinger. Uh, a lot of immigrants have served in extremely high positions 
and of great service, and there are four of them. And I know I didn't want to spend too much time on the famous people or the sports stars, but I did want to point out that our country has depended upon immigrants from the beginning to get us through very difficult um, policy issues, including these four. Yeah, yeah, no question about it. And I, I, I'm, I'm glad I picked the four I did. Uh, you, you know, the two secretaries of state, I think it speaks volumes about our country that when they, uh, when a president sends someone over on a diplomatic mission, uh, these two were able to say, I wasn't even born in America. The country I represent is one that can assimilate and welcome somebody who wasn't even born in the country and now put them in a position of responsibility. In terms of Yuval and Dina, they're, they're very smart, capable people. And uh, again, it's an example of how the country can benefit uh, by having smart people come, come and want to become a citizen. Now, I want to put up uh, the, the last two, Mr. President, Roya Maboub from Afghanistan and Tina Tran from Vietnam. If these two women don't get out of their country, they're likely to die. Uh, in fact, Roya Maboub right. had become a target of the Taliban. Tina Tran, the pirates got her, but she managed to get here. Now we're leaving Afghanistan after 20 years. I don't want you to comment on the decision. I know, I know you don't like to do that, but should we begin a massive entry program for the women who have worked with our troops and who have become educated? Because we know if the Taliban retakes territory, these women are not going to fare well, including Roya Maboub and people like her. They're like the trans yeah, I saw, who wanted to get out. I saw Roya the other day, and uh, you know her reaction was, I sure hope diplomacy saves women. You know, I'm not sure that's possible. I sure hope so too. And it looks like to me that uh, the Secretary of State put some emphasis on that, that, you know, they'll be able to hopefully protect women through diplomacy. Uh, as I say, I hope it works. If not, I really do think the United States needs to make sure those who helped us and those who will be targeted uh, because of their help and because of their fighting for freedom for women and girls ought to be given access to the country. And uh, I'm deeply concerned about the plight of women in Afghanistan. Laura and I have spent a lot of time working with Afghan women. And uh, you might remember she gave the radio address speaking to Afghan women it had an electrifying effect. And since we uh, went in, the, the, the rights of women have improved dramatically as has education and health care. And you know, this, we're taking a big risk because that could be reversed quickly. And, uh, oh. you know, um, the question we got to ask is, is it our national interest that women in Afghanistan can, uh, you know, succeed? And I happen to believe it is. We agree on that, Mr. President. Now, like the translators, especially those who have helped us, but I'm just worried about the PhDs that have come out in 20 years and the masters and the Taliban does not like women being educated. Uh, I want to go back to the politics of immigration. You mentioned your Today Show remarks yesterday. I talk a lot about it on this show because I'm one of these people. Let everybody stay who's not violent, but let's get that wall finished. Tom Cotton has a merit system. I believe you believe in the merit system for admissions. Do you not, Mr. President? I do. I do. And the reason why is uh, not, only, uh, not only will it help our economy, but it'll make the border more secure. If people are doing work that needs to be done and we have a legal entry system that enables them to do so, they don't have to sneak across the border. So step one of help fixing a broken border is to rework our work laws, both high skilled and lower skilled. You know, Hugh, I'm a tree farmer, believe it or not. And, uh, and we've got eight Mexican laborers on our farm. And they, I think we're in our third year with them working there, but every year they have to reapply for a visa. So the way the rule works is you apply and you go through the bureaucracy and then they have to go home for two months out of every year, which is fine because they go home in the, uh, during the season where we're not uh, you know, spending much time uh, digging trees. And the question though is, can they be let back in? Will the government let them in? And it creates a lot of uncertainty for a small business. Because if the government at one point says, no, you can't come back, all those years of training goes down the tubes. And so we're, it sets us back. And it, I'm just one of many, many, many examples of small business owners that rely upon, you know, foreign labor. Uh, and 
there's got to be an orderly way to do it. So that, to me, that's what a merit system means. By the way, I too am for a fence. I, I probably built more fence than any president did. But the, a broken system makes it harder to enforce the border, no matter how much fence you have. Uh, for example, border patrol, border patrol agents are no longer, uh, they're, they're worrying more about asylum cases than they are about border enforcement. And therefore, it makes the border less secure. And so if we can fix the asylum system, uh, you know, have more judges, more courts, then all of a sudden we get, you know, a more secure border. There is a fringe, Mr. President, on both sides, uh, a fanatical nativist fringe that you alluded to uh, a couple days ago, and I don't think that's very big. And then there's a fanatical fringe on the left that wants an open border, and I don't think that has much support. It does not seem to me to be that difficult. If President Biden came to you and President Clinton asked you to chair a task force, bring in some people from across the spectrum, there are 100 different views on immigration. It's not like putting a helicopter on Mars and seeing it fly. This is not a hard problem. <laughs> and I actually think that the Republicans are open to a comprehensive deal. I know we've tried, we've swung and we've missed, but those were closed systems. Those were done on the Hill as opposed to bringing in people from the outside. Do you think it could actually get done in a commission setting? Well, you know, it's interesting. I know I think a probably more practical way you is pick, pick off each problem one by one, start with DACA, and that'll give people confidence uh, to then go to the next issue. I think the two easiest issues to solve, at least the two most logical issues to solve, are DACA and work. And, uh, you, you know, our, our you and I share the same view on undocumented aliens, that if they uh, if they uh, pay their taxes and are good citizens and are assimilating, they ought to be given not immediate citizenship, but a right to become a citizen after those who are going through the legal process finish their time. And but to me, that'll be a harder issue because what will happen is people will scream amnesty. And once you lob the word amnesty out there, it uh, scares people. Yeah, I don't worry about that because I actually think the number of people who respond to that that call and respond thing is actually smaller. And Dr. Kissinger in his book, Diplomacy, said about big problems, world problems, the bigger the problem set you make it, the easier it is to achieve a peace because there are move, more moving parts. So that's where we disagree. I want to put everything on the table and get maybe you and, and Clinton together and 20 other people and come up with a simplified, I mean, it's just too doggone complicated when it comes out. Let me close, Mr. President, yeah. with a couple of quick questions. Let me say Come one on thing. Right. Let me say one thing. Excuse me. Uh, that's what we're doing. We've got a coalition of uh, like-minded people uh, working this issue, and many of them are involved on Capitol Hill. So the Bush Center is spearheading a reform movement. It's quiet, except for this book, which makes it not quiet. But it's uh, we're lining up, and uh, you know, I'm, uh, we're talking to people about. Uh, you know, what needs to be done. I mean, the Koch brothers, for example, I know that's a word that scares a lot of people on the left, but they're very much in favor of uh, a, a rational immigration policy. And uh, and they're putting money behind it and they're pushing hard. And so we're, we're very much involved with what you said. Now, it, it, there hadn't been uh, uh, inter-party inter outreach yet, but maybe it's not quite right. My view is uh, if the president's sincere about this, he ought to sit down with, uh, you know, some rational Republicans. He, he's got to give. He's got to finish his initial agenda. However, he got a lot on his plate right now. But eventually, I, I think there's a deal to be done. I do, and I think um, uh, uh, Bush Clinton task force that talked to Tom Cotton at the same time they're talking to uh, uh, more expansively minded people would would do a lot of good. I want to ask you about last picture, Paula Rendon, who was a second mother to your family, and she's the only person in the book who's not alive now because she died. I found this fascinating that uh, your mom would post rules that included up at Kenny Bunkport, ask Paula if you can help her. It's like the Cider House rules. I don't know if you ever read John Irving's book, The Cider House Rules, but <laughs> tell us about Paula Rendon. So she's, uh, she shows up at our doorstep in Houston, Texas, 1959, I'm 13 years old, and she's scared to death. She's frightened, uh, but she's determined, it turns out to make a better life for her three children. And uh, she ends up from that point on to like recently being a part of our family. The amazing thing about Paula, Paola is she raised two families, ours along with mother and hers and, uh, and both flourished. She was determined. 
she was tough when she needed to be tough. She was loving all the way through, and she taught us all what it what it means to be a uh, a hardworking uh, dreamer. I got to ask you that you you mentioned that she was tough, as does Doro in your book. Uh, who would you rather get caught by, your mother or uh, Paula, when maybe beer was involved or a rollicking good time? Who would you rather face up to? Yeah, yeah, I'd rather get caught by my mother. <laughs> because Paula would unleash, she could unleash some serious, serious dialogue. <laughs> Last two questions, Mr. President. Uh, I want to know if you've caught up on your reading for like, I, le I read Daniel Silva and Chuck Box. I know you read thrillers. Do you read those two guys? Are you caught up on your Silva and your Chuck Box? Yeah, yeah, I'm a Silva reader. and He's a good friend of mine. I ride, I ride mountain bikes with him. And uh, yeah, I read everything he puts out. I also read Box. Uh, I just finished Rick, Rick Atkinson's book on the Revolutionary War. I don't know if you read any of his World War II trilogy, but no, he's a great writer. And uh, yeah, it's good. It's really good. It's, uh, it, it's, it's worth reading. And the reason I say that is I think, you know, history is so important, Hugh, and you know this, that, you know, I hope we don't lose sight of uh, the need to study our history in order to uh, understand lessons from the past and have a better future. Anyway, Rick's, Rick's a good writer and uh, I'm reading all the time. I mean, I'm painting all the time, but I'm reading all the time. Have you read Matthew McConaughey's Green Light yet? Cause I wanna know if he'd make a good governor in your eyes. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, you know, he, he seems to be a charming guy. I met him one time. I'll tell you one thing, he's charismatic. Now, whether or not he can put up with all the noise all the rubber chicken circuits, you know, all the stuff that goes on. Uh, you know, the criticism can be pretty harsh, you. And uh, the question would be, does he have a set of principles firm enough to not worry about what the critics say? And, uh, and you know, that's, that's, I remember my friend Nolan Ryan said, I'm thinking about running for agriculture commissioner in Texas. And I said, Nolan, do you like it when the sports columnists criticize you? He said, I don't like it. I said, well, then you're not going to like running for agriculture commissioner. Well, I know McGonaghy is ahead in the Dallas Morning News poll. We talked about it on this show when Green Lights came out, and all of a sudden there's a McGonaghy boom, and Austin is booming. And I, I do think sometimes people underestimate when you run for governor in Texas, don't you have to eat like a thousand barbecue sandwiches? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and shake 10 million hands if you're any good at it. But, you know, maybe politics has changed so dramatically since I was there that you can campaign via the Internet. Uh, when I was I put out I went to every native, uh, you know, uh, Mexican-American parade, every you know, black parade, every parade there was so that people would get to see that I was willing to work hard for their vote. And, you know, Texas is so big now, maybe that's not the case anymore. But Maggie's going to have to work hard if he's going to be the nominee of any party. Well, I want to appreciate your time. I cannot tell you how much I enjoyed out of many one. I think it will go a long way to advance the conversation about immigration in the country. Mr. President, thank you for your time. Good luck on your next book, which I hope is already underway. I love being with you, Hugh. Thank you. Thank you, sir.